Reaction to Inter Milan's failure to qualify for either the Champions League or Europa League knockout rounds continues to pour in across Italy. Gazzetta dello Sport, uh, no translation needed there. Euro flop. Bravo is still with us, as is Mina Razuki, who joins the show. Uh, Mina, I'll start with you. This was just perfectly set up for Inter. They needed just that one goal against Shakhtar Donetsk. Couldn't get it to get through to the Champions League knockout rounds. Describe the level of disappointment then around this result. Hugely disappointing. And I think that you could really see that from the press conference that Antonio Conte held afterwards when he was answering as well to Sky Italia to questions being posed by the likes of Fabio Cabello. And he was so irritable. You could tell that the team wanted this so much, but at the same time, didn't really know they were carrying out the instructions handed to him, but it was almost like there was too much nervous energy. It was like they're, they're, they only had this plan A, there was no plan B. It was a question posed by Fabio Capello, is there a plan B? Mm. And he said, yes, but I'm not going to tell you. So is this just going to be a secret that we all just hold on to and perhaps one day we might get to figure this out? Because when it looks like when you're playing Shakhtar Donetsk and you really need to get another win, I mean, not just for the simple sake that the reputation of the club is, is is on the line here, but it's also money. At the end of the day, Champions League and victories in that tournament and progression in that tournament allows you to buy the players that can make Antonio Conte happy. Those are one of the reasons why Juventus could build and eventually have the squad that they have. But considering 230 million has been invested into the squad after Conte has arrived at Inter, it's too little, to be honest. Mm. Uh, Rabo, you're a long-standing Conte admirer. Is he on the hook for this? Yes, because it wasn't just this game. Yes, this was the game they should have won. They had chances to win. They didn't play particularly well. Uh, there was nervous energy, as Mina said. I don't think you had to change the tactics. They had to do what they were doing better. Uh, but it wasn't just in this game that they've lost their place in Europe. It was in the first couple of games where they didn't get wins, where they should have won again. I thought their performance at home against Real Madrid was really poor. Uh, Vidal... Uh, inexplicably getting sent off. And, and that summed up the old discipline in that game. They haven't defended well enough in Europe. But if they'd have taken their chances in the game against Shakhtar, they should have won and they should have gone through. But it wasn't to be. And Antonio Conte, I said a couple of weeks ago, he was under a little bit of pressure because they, they lost badly to, to Real Madrid. Uh, then they had two good wins in Serie A. He's now got to concentrate on Serie A. Mina, saw you shaking your head. Why? Yeah. No, because I don't think it's about doing the same thing better. I think that's the whole thing. They've already played Shakhtar. They had won 5-0 on the Europa League. And what has really annoyed Antonio Conte was that they had figured out a way of actually neutralizing Conte's side. So it was about trying to find something else. You know that when you're playing Inter, that what they're going to do so what is do you basically think, what go do you out think plan B and then be? deliver. What, what do you think plan it's B It's always about delivering then? crosses into the middle. They attempted 44 crosses. Nothing was going to work out. So what should you plan, need to be able to build the plan a play- B have been? Ericsson, having a bit more magic going through the middle, perhaps bringing on substitutions earlier than the 68th minute, perhaps taking Galliardini and Ashley Young, who are having no effect on the game a lot earlier, having a, an ability to do something other than just deliver crosses and hope that Lukaku can do something with his back to goal and continue to battle up front. I think it's become so predictable for Inter and Antonio Conte. And we know that when it comes to the Champions League and European trophies, that quality matters at the end of the day. I don't think it was a case of the players not carrying out the instructions. I think they did their job perfectly. I think the part of his job for somebody who's being 12, being paid 12 million, that is the second highest earner in Serie A as a coach is Paolo Fonseca on 2.5 million. Look at the difference. For, us, for that to be just a tactical plan, the only club to have been knocked out of the Champions League. And we're talking about Shakhtar Donetsk, that's not even dominating the Ukrainian league. Dynamo Kiev is at the top of that league. It shouldn't be so easy to be able to just neutralize Lautaro Martinez and Romelu Lukaku and that Inter have absolutely no way of getting through. Ericsson being thrown on and given five minutes, hopefully to find a plan. And he actually did something interesting. But unfortunately, he only had five minutes. Mm. Well, uh, uh, Antonio Conte's game plan is always to get it into the front two as early as possible and to get the front two linking up with each other. Then if that's blocked off, they go wider and get crosses into the box. So plan B was getting crosses into the box but they didn't get on the end of it. Enough of them. So they created an, uh, enough chances. They got the ball into the box enough times. Uh, Ericsson coming on. Ericsson is not wanted uh, into Milan, and I'm not sure he was going to do anything. And I, I think Antonio was quite right when he said to the people that were asking him the questions, if I brought on Sanchez earlier, I'd have upset the balance of the side. I still thought, he still thought, and I still thought that Lukaku and Martinez would, would get a goal at some point 
before the end of the game. By bringing on Sanchez, where were you going to bring him on? You're going to have to take one of those players off. And at the moment, Sanchez isn't good enough to take over. If he was going to play him in a wide area, I could understand it. But 15 minutes coming on is long enough to, to influence the game when you're just trying to get one goal. And I think the questioning okay, was, was right to him. And I think he's got every right to answer it back the way he did. OK, Robert, let me ask you this question. When you are up against a team that is really not even trying to win the game, perhaps even staging just one or two real uh, counterattacks, why are we playing with three central defenders? Why are not more risks being taken to try to in, uh, invest in and put in well, players well, a lot they, they earlier that could centers. actually attack their balance? Take yeah, off one of those centers. central they're, defenders. They're and three make... centre-backs, but they're not actually staying at the back. The three centers, the two wide centers, particularly Bastoni, he's coming out with the ball. The wing-backs are playing much, much higher. They're almost playing as an outside right and an outside left. And that's maybe where he could have brought on Sanchez to play in one of the wide areas. But they had lots of possession. They weren't really being threatened on the counter. But the wide centre-halves weren't just playing as centre-half. They were playing as attacking, uh, attacking players, getting forward and getting balls into the front or getting it wide so crosses came into the box. I wouldn't. I wouldn't really criticise Antonio Conte's uh, change of tactics or lack of change of tactics. They just didn't do what they normally do well enough. And they haven't done it well enough in some of the other games. Listen, Robert, it's me, not... I just think they need... Yeah, Go sorry. ahead, Mina. I'm sorry. I'm, I just think they need to be able to uh, know how to defeat sides when there isn't a lot of space in front of them. And the fact is, is when you are a very good defensive side that knows how to block the spaces and to always seem to struggle, and that's the obstacle they need to overcome. All right, let's leave the uh, inter-tactic talks for the uh, uh, next Serie A podcast. Uh, I want to ask you this, Mina, because you're there on the ground, so you got a sense of this. Uh, Gab hammered Antonio Conte after the, the post-match comments yesterday. What's been the reaction uh, to what he said? Oh, it's been everywhere, to be honest. And... This is the problem. I mean, when you bring Antonio Conte, there's always a drama on the sidelines. It can be very entertaining. Um, and we know that he knows how to get results, at least domestically. But unfortunately, at the moment, the way that he is responding to these things, we're talking about Fabio Capello, Alessandro Costa Corta was also in the studio, um, who mentioned the fact that he felt very disappointed by his behavior. Capello said after the interview, um, after he had asked those questions, that he has to understand, Conte, that we can't only talk when things are going well. Sometimes questions need to be asked when things are going badly as well. And you would expect more of a, a reasoned, logical answer. At the end of the day, he also, Capello also noted the fact that Giampiero, Giampiero Gasparini did a tremendous job with Atalanta as well yesterday, qualifying against Ajax. Um, and the fact is, is he was a great coach who knows how to change things in the middle of the game and then happened to drop in Max Allegri's name, which is something that will infuriate <laughs> Conte should he listen back to that. But I thought that that would be an interesting thing to add as well. All right, guys, let's uh, turn our attention to Juventus. We've talked a lot about the Juventus-Barcelona match, mostly from the Barcelona perspective uh, on this show. Do you feel like we've seen the beginning of a turning point, uh, Mina, under Andrea Pirlo? A couple good performances in the league and then really a, a, a total uh, domination of Barcelona when it mattered most to get first in the group? It's still very up and down. I mean, it wasn't a very good performance against Torino over the weekend. And then something clicked in the second half where it seemed like they wanted to play like a big team again and play it so with a lot more ambition, a lot more dedication and commitment to the cause. And that's when they managed to turn the game around. But Torino do have a history of always conceding goals um, and throwing away great leads. So I don't think too many conclusions can be drawn. When it came to Barcelona, Juventus are very good at upping their game when it's a big opponent and Ronaldo had something to prove. A lot of the team had something to prove and they enjoy and relish these big competitions. So I'd like to say this is the turning point, but as we all know, this is Andrea Pirlo's first season in coaching. I don't think that we really, he really even knows what his starting midfield is, the, what he would want to see at the moment. It seems to work really well up front with Ronaldo and Morata, but... Other than defense and attack, the midfield is the area that he really needs to figure out before we can find some stability in that side. Robo, you called the Juventus-Barcelona match. Was there anything you saw from Juve that you hadn't seen to this point? Well, uh, I thought they were better organized. I thought they had more dynamism going forward. They tried to get the ball forward that little bit quicker. We saw Weston McKenney making runs from midfield. He's often been the holding midfield player, but he was playing on the right-hand side of a of a midfield three, I would say, with Ramsey tucking in from the left-hand side. He made great runs, McKenney. Uh, I thought the, the centre-halves played well. De Ligt looked really composed on the ball and came out with it well. But Barcelona didn't press them, so it was easy for Bonucci, Danilo and De Ligt to come out with the ball and, and start their, their football and start their passing game going. 
about it was a good performance, but I agree with Mina. Remember the Benevento game? Juventus didn't play well in that. Yeah. They didn't play well against Torino in the first half. You, it, it's just one game against Barcelona doesn't make it the start mm -hmm. of the Juventus being a great side again. Uh, Mina, real quick on Weston McKinney. A couple goals in his last uh, two games. How close is he to locking down a starting spot? I would say very close. I mean, if you read any of the media, they're just uh, talking and it's his symphony of compliments at the moment for the American because of his ability to really get into the box, score those goals, make a difference, really pull that side up. And for a player who's come in from, from the Bundesliga to Serie A, we thought it would take him a lot longer to sort of understand what was going on because it's such a huge difference between such an attacking league to one that's so tactical. And yeah, McKinney has been a breath of fresh air and Andrea Pirlo had taken several, wanted to really exhaust the fact that this was a wonderful player that he really wanted on the team. And he thought that he was such a great addition because he offers something different to all the other midfielders he has. And then it shows because he chose to play him against Barcelona, the biggest game and the one that would have secured them the top spot, which he did indeed help them do. Thanks so much for watching ESPN on YouTube. And for more sports highlights and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for premium content and live streaming, subscribe to ESPN+.